Okay, top of the hour, everyone. Um, so we'll kick off our uh, webinar for today. Have you outgrown your accounting software? My name is Hayden McCall, and uh, I, I'm from iStart and have been promoting this, working with NetSuite and uh, in, in, uh, out to you all. So thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to have a conversation with Stephen Basford, uh, who's been through um, and has outgrown his accounting software um, and been through that journey. So we'll we'll be interested to hear um, what that pathway looks like from him. And also Rich Ward, uh, who uh, is from NetSuite, has promised me there's uh, not going, going to be any sales pitch today, but he um, is responsible for competitive intelligence for NetSuite. So he understands the ERP land landscape in, in quite a lot of detail. So he's going to chip in uh, in behind Stephen uh, and, and give you some details. So hi to Stephen and, and Rich. Um, and welcome to you today too. Um, little bit of housekeeping, if I can get the slide to, to move over, and there you go, there there are um, today's panellists um, re repeating what I've just said. Uh, Stephen, Head of Software and Systems at Concilian, uh, he's going to tell us a bit more about what Concilian does. Um, just uh, housekeeping, if you do have questions to ask uh, during the, the course of today, just fire them in uh, in the Q&A panel um, i'll see those come up um, if it's in context and and we've got time then we'll crack into uh, asking the question otherwise we'll, we've got a bit of time at the end uh, to do that um, but otherwise we'll crack into content and ask Stephen uh, to give us a little bit of background about what concilian does and and particularly um, um, you know what systems were you running uh, prior to, to moving to erp Stephen. Thanks for your time today. So, um, yeah, I'll give you a little bit of a background of Concilian. Um, to paraphrase our website, we're a uh, global and independent provider of cash handling solutions. So, so what does that mean? That means we provide um, cash cash counting solutions. So, if you go into a bank branch, for example, um, there'll be a row of ATMs. Next to them, there might be something where you can deposit coins, or uh, change notes for coins, or smaller notes, things like that. And behind the, the teller's desk, there'll be small machines. So we'll provide all of those things to whoever wants to buy them, really. Um, we have quite a complex business, so we don't just sell these things. We service them and we manufacture them as well. So we manufacture our own machines and we distribute from third party suppliers. Um, we are headquartered in Sydney, um, big operation in Australia. We're in um, New Zealand. Uh, Singapore and the UK. Uh, we manufacture out of the UK and we distribute out of the other three locations. Um, we've been on quite a growth trajectory over the last um, 10 years. Um, and hence the sort of move to 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 NetSuite and, and to have more robust systems um, and more things under one kind of hood. Um, so before we migrated to NetSuite, which was in uh, 2018 is when we migrated, uh, we were on zero for our accounting, um, service now for our service, uh, unleashed for the inventory, uh, net stock for inventory forecasting, um, pipeline deals for CRM. Um, and there was a bunch of other little sort of peripheral things around that. Now, some of them were held together by APIs or clunky APIs, but I mean, you know, you couldn't really have much of a, a, a sort of scalable system when you had all these disparate things that didn't really talk to each other very well. Yeah, but a list of list of um I guess cloud software that a lot of companies do have in place that zero unleashed is a is a very common uh pairing <laughs> uh that you, you see around the place and and I and you know you've got a multi company, multi currency, multi subsidiaries going on, a multi country manufacturing, import, distribution, um yeah, service function that that's never yeah. an easy one to to pull <laughs> together. So I can understand why you you might have uh, been stretching the straps a, a little bit. Um, yes. I, yes. Okay. So let's talk about. Um, I guess that that growing realization that um, you, 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 that set of systems wasn't cutting it. What, what did that feel yeah, like? Yeah, sure. Sure. Well, I mean, um, there's been a big move towards castle, uh, cash automation. Um, cause it's quite a costly thing for the banks and your high street retailers and in Australia, RSLs to, to do, um, 
but they, they have to do it. Cash is still a sort of viable, viable way of paying for things. Um, so between 2015 and 2017, we, we, our revenue doubled. Um, nice problem to have, right? Um, uh, and we, we expanded out into Singapore. Now with zero, we couldn't use uh, multi-subsidiaries. So, I mean, that was a no brainer. We had to move away from that anyway, unless you wanted two instances of zero, um, which we didn't. Um, and then the service business also grew quite substantially on the back of that. If you think about the products that we sell, a lot of it's customer facing to, to banks, um, or you've got big back office solutions in sort of Kmart, Target, your high street retailers. Um, so the uptime for the customers is, is, is very important. Um, so we've got a fleet of field technicians around the, the, uh, the country. Um, they'll have a lot of stock on them. So managing that with Unleashed and Zero was just an absolute nightmare. And you'd, you'd have you sort of inventory write-offs. You wouldn't be able to bill correctly. You wouldn't be able to log your time. Um, so that was that was a sort of uh, straw that broke the camel's back, really. So we made the leap in 2018. Had about a sort of uh, nine to 12 months of prep and then uh, then migrated. Mm. Mm. Uh, did you say? I think we mentioned yesterday we were we were just getting a, a briefing session. There was an acquisition or two within that, the mix as well. I'm sure that didn't help. <laughs> yeah, there was. There was. We sort of we've grown or organically and inorganically. Um, so we uh, set up a um, entity in Singapore, expanded out to there on our own, um, and grew that from the, the ground up. Uh, we acquired a manufacturing company in the UK around 2018 um and that was a sort of competitive move to you know so we we could own some of the stuff that we sold we weren't just primarily a distributor um so we, we own the ip of that as well um but that came with its own complexities because then we also had to to go all right well can netsuite help us with manufacturing yeah it can great okay um so we uh there was there was a lot of disparate systems again in that manufacturing company it had been around for for, for a long, long time. Um, so there was Sage for the accounting, something called eFax for the bombs um, with their service. Um, I didn't mention that to you previously, but um, with their service, they actually did that on pen and paper. So uh, there was an obvious efficiency there once we, <laughs> once we put good, that suite. Good British efficiency. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> when, when did the migration happen? When uh, the migration go happened like? that. That, that was about 2019. So we had quite a, a bit of prep for that one because obviously when you're manufacturing, when you're migrating um, bills of materials and, and and stuff like that, it gets quite complicated. Um, the things we yeah. build are, are pretty so complex. The, the main uh, NetSuite go live. The, the main NetSuite no, go no, live. No, no, no secret, secret here, it was NetSuite that you went with, but um, it, uh, uh, that, the main go live for NetSuite was what sort of timing? It was the the main go live for NetSuite was the first of uh, July two thousand eighteen, um, and then we bolted on the UK about a year later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right, Rich. We'll, we'll get to you. I should should also have introduced guys just uh, in in the background from from the team um, uh, events from NetSuite. So uh, she's she's just uh, taking notes in in behind things. Um, so jumping to having implemented. NetSuite into the business. What what's the biggest impact that you've seen, Stephen? Well, as, you know what? That's a, that's a good question. It sort of depends on on what day of the week you ask me that question. Um, <laughs> I mean, obviously, there's the you know, the the finance guys are very happy. We've got a happy finance team right now. Um, you know, they can look at everything under one hood. Um, I think you know, from from my personal point of view, the the biggest impact is having that sort of source of truth that single source of truth where you've got you know one list of suppliers one list of customers we've got our crm in in netsuite you know that sort of consolidation of data and the and and the sort of um the confidence you have when you pull data out of netsuite and it's one system and it's not three or four different systems sometimes talking to each other um so i mean that's probably been the biggest impact and and, and from that i guess we've it's, it's allowed us to grow Right. So, you know, we, we moved into New Zealand uh, October last year. That was such a smooth sort of implementation because it was like, OK, we've got all our systems, we've got our processes. Let's just put another um, subsidiary in NetSuite and, and we're up and running. Mm. Um, and you've been involved all the way 
through. So you, you've you've taken the the full pain um, from from pre to pre to post. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Um, yeah. So I yeah in 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 the sort of decision making to setting it up um, the data consolidation from all the disparate systems. Um, you know, training all of that stuff. Um, so yeah, yeah, I've got got previous with it. You've got the you've got the uh, the scars on your knuckles to to prove it. <laughs> um, so yeah, talk a bit about the, the the selection and Rich. That this is this is your um, area to come in behind. But Stephen, if you give a little bit of background in terms of um, what process did you go through and in, in deciding you know, your, what was your short? Yeah, I mean and, we 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 did yeah. look at a few. Um, you know, obviously SAP. Um, you know, or do we do multiple instances of zero? Just get some out of the box solutions. Um, but our CFO, who's still our CFO right now, um, he he worked with NetSuite previously and he was a very strong advocate of it. And then also when you've got the CFO telling you what ERP system you should use, you know, that was a pretty much a done deal then. Um so uh so that was that was the decision process. There wasn't there were, and there weren't a lot of alternatives, if I'm being quite frank. I mean, you know, we had NetService, which is the build service management system in, in NetSuite now. Um, that meant that we could bolt our service onto onto NetSuite as well, um, which was the, the, the moment we realised that it was a complete no brainer for us. Mm. So that's so next service is a module within NetSuite and it runs your whole field, field service. service. Yeah, well, next, uh, yeah, NetSuite, yeah, NetSuite bought it a, about a year ago, and it's now the NetSuite field service management module. Um, okay. Okay, so I, I guess a fairly abbreviated uh, decision with CFO and behind uh, knowing what he was dealing with and uh, he she um, yeah, yeah. was was dealing with uh, Netsuite was was top of the list and stayed there. Um, Rich, I guess that's probably not um, always the case. No, it isn't. Uh, I, I wish it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, many evaluations commence with self research on the internet um, or speaking with industry peers, and I think. Uh, many businesses then use that approach to uh, create a, a shortlist. And once they've got a shortlist in place, uh, they then go out to market. So businesses use a, a wide range of techniques, ranging from an unstructured wish list to very formal request for proposals or RFPs. Um, invariably, the process also includes some form of demonstration. Uh, and these can range from quick one hour, what I call beauty parades. It's impossible to, to experience in the ERP in an hour, so I call the beauty parades, to very detailed demonstrations that can even span days. And this is very often complemented then with reference calls. Um, I think, you know, if you, if you sift through all of those choices, successful evaluations often commence with a proper business case driven by strategic objectives, a list of functional requirements, and due diligence of what the partnership and experience long term will look like. Um, very often, I see organizations going into their evaluation just focusing on features, functions, and price. Now, while features and functions are important because invariably they've come about looking at this project because either they're trying to resolve challenges or they're trying to chase growth or you know growth imperatives. And functional capability inside of an application is important. Um, but when they go into the process, understanding, you know, what does this business case look like? Um, what are our objectives, you know, looking five to 10 years forward? That sets a beautiful framework then to underpin what the evaluation should really look at. On the one hand, features and functions, yes. But on the other hand, what does that strategic outlook look like? And what does the risk look like? Yeah, okay. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> Stephen... I'm assuming you would have had all of that groundwork done and you knew exactly what your objectives were heading into it, but has it turned out how you planned? Uh, yes, in, in, in a word. Um, I mean, we knew we wanted something that would allow us to have a sort of scalable business. You know, we knew we were growing. We knew we wanted to, you know, have different subsidiaries in different countries. So, you know, we knew we wanted to grow what we wanted to do, you know, in terms of manufacturing and growing the service business. So, so yeah, um, I mean, there's been some nice quite kind of things that have come out of the, the, the side of it um, that we didn't expect. Um, stuff like, uh, um, there's I was two, two very good examples. I mean, the first thing is we use our CRM uh, next week um, 
which is which is great. Um, we had the thing called pipeline deals previously, which was just it, it just I mean, one of the sales guys had three billion dollars of pipeline in there. And it's like, OK, nobody's looking after this data. But now it's under the same thing. Everybody's got dashboards. You know, it's on the CFO's dashboard. People are sort of held to account a bit more. So the there's, you know, the ability to forecast, especially with the stuff that we we sell, um, you know, because it has quite long lead times um is 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 very important um and some of the other stuff we've done as well i mean because we work with with our sort of end customers particularly the banks they drive us to do a lot of compliance um now what we've done is we've used a sort of customization of netsuite to 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 log some of that compliance you know if we if somebody gets electrocuted in a bank branch you know we can link that to the product or we can link that to the the technician or the or, or, or the service case that they were on. So there's some sort of nice little sort of features that we didn't expect that have come out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's all, all good news. Um, okay, so Rich, um, talk us again drawing on experience across multiple um, companies and, and uh, you know selection processes. Um, what, what tends to be the tipping points for where, where accounting systems um kick in um or convert to to uh, erp yeah so uh the tipping points are as broad as probably their evaluation criteria and approaches businesses use i think um you know i'm just looking at it holistically now i think from a vendor perspective we most often find tipping points occurring when businesses are growing number one rising in complexity and rising in sophistication and you heard a lot of uh, that verbiage from Stephen, you know, just as his experience of of what his organization has gone through and, and some of the pinch points that they were experiencing to transition out of accounting software into ERP rings true to exactly what I just said. Um, when organizations go through growth, rising complexity and sophistication, this places pressure on the functional and technology limitations of accounting software. So businesses often come to us um, with comments such as we have no control over our processes, um, we have a load of workarounds, we run our operations in spreadsheets, um, we have limited visibility into our business. And I think those are some very common themes that we hear. Now, the underlying causes, you know, underneath that is really where it becomes super interesting. So there are functional limitations to accounting software. They don't do advanced financial. So, for example, uh, advanced billing, revenue recognition, APA or uh, APA or automation. What Stephen said: multi-company management, intercompany eliminations, and they also have very limited capabilities in project and inventory management. No CRM and no FSM. So, no customer relationship management and no field service management. So, that's essentially what they do. They're they're an accounting package. This often necessitates the need for add-ons to be integrated and multiple instances of that accounting software to be born. Now, as you could imagine, this creates severe architectural complexity, um, which creates then a load of problems unto itself. As you add an, each application to your architecture, it introduces the potential for a data silo, uh, inefficient integration, process fragmentation, and small businesses do not have the luxury of large IT teams to manage complex IT architectures. They focused at running their businesses and keeping themselves cash flow positive. Um, over and above functional limitations that we find or functional pinch points, there are often technical limitations as well. So accounting software either have hard or soft cutoffs or limits or both. So for example, they might have a cutoff around the number of um, users, the number of invoices they can issue, the number of fixed asset items that they can manage, or the number of transactions that can operate through their API. So I've mentioned an incredibly broad range of pinch points. And what we do find is many organizations will come to us with a couple of those. Um, with the overarching pain around process control and visibility. And then we when, when we start unpacking the organization, we then realize that there are particular pinch points either around the functional limitations itself, the arch overall architectural complexity, and potentially technical limits as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to think what, about. What, yeah, there, there is. And I, there's a key word in amongst that was integration. And I, and I, and I, I guess uh, there's a, there's a, 
market story that goes something along the lines of go, go to your cloud software provider and just plug them in together, get the best of breed and they'll integrate together and you'll be able to do everything magically. Um, uh, uh, Stephen, you touched on it, but but I, I got a sense there was a bit more pain in behind um, your, your, your comment. You want to talk to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, that was so our, our initial um, architecture was ex exactly like Rich was describing. It was, you know, a bunch of out-of-the-box things, Zero Unleashed, et cetera, et cetera. Most of them held together by APIs. Now, when that works, great. But it works probably, I don't know, 50% of the time. You know, what, one of these things will get upgraded. It will get upgraded overnight. It will be a mandatory thing. It will knock out the API. Um, you know, and the, and, the, and the more complex you make all these all these connections, you know, the more points of failure there are. Um, so, I mean, essentially, we were losing money for this stuff. You know, we couldn't we couldn't keep track of our inventory properly. We couldn't build correctly. Um, so, you know, the justification to moving to NetSuite um, was there was a there was a pretty strong business case for that, just with the financials. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so just uh, for the audience, a uh, reminder just to get um, Q&A. So I, I should have said we're, we're aiming sort of 30, 35 minutes. So we're, we're at about 20 minutes through now. Uh, question six of 10. Um, so if you've got questions coming up, just just fire them into the Q&A um, and we, we'll get to them. Uh, but I've got one there already. So we'll come to that at the end. Um, Number seven, um, just in terms of advice, and Stephen, maybe lead off again with with this one. Um, people on the call heading down this pathway, what would you what would you advise them to do? Yeah, okay. So I, I, I get asked this a lot. Um, I mean, the, the the main thing I would say is that when you're migrating, spend a lot of time, more time than you think, getting all your data together um, to migrate. You know, rationalize it, take out the stuff you don't need. I mean, you know, I think when we migrated from ServiceNow, for example, had nine different spellings of Australia in it, right? Um, so you've got to sit down, do the legwork in that, and that will pay you dividends in the future because you'll have a clean system that you can kind of trust from, from day one. Um, don't just don't just take it out and put it in, um, take it out of the old system, put it in, make sure that what you're putting into the new system is right. And it's, it's your really good opportunity to get something great from the first day. Mm. Yep, heard that one before, Rich. He took my point. <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah. take it from a, I'll take it from a higher level, if I may, um, sure. because, yeah, data cleansing and preparation is super important. I'd like to take it really from a 50,000 view point of view. N number one, you need executive ownership. So if your organization is looking at moving off small accounting software to an ERP, you have to have your executives involved. Um, the business transformation and digital transformation that you're going to go through an organization deserves the priority of an executive to own this project and it shouldn't be delegated to anyone lower than an executive that's the first point i want to make and it's 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 a challenge i see within organizations when very often a project of this magnitude of this potential impact within an organization gets delegated to a, a smaller project team and there's no executive ownership on it Second point I want to make is um, an ERP is more complex than accounting software. It is uh, because it does a lot more. So change management cannot be underestimated and it has to be built into your project. So most businesses journeys begin on day one, go live. And that's when the organization holistically has to get on board. And uh, those employees then have to go through some form of change management and adopt the solution. I've too often seen really good software sitting on a shelf because change management wasn't wasn't incorporated as, as part of the overall project. Um, the third point I want to make is uh, make your people available to the project. So an ERP project requires people's time, not only to share their experience and insights of their organization with the consulting team that's going to do the implementation with them, but Implementing an ERP is a team exercise. So on the one hand, um, there needs to be a functional consultant and, and potentially a developer and the organization themselves. 
Um, and that's how the implementation or the migration needs to be seen. It's a partnership. Um, third, uh, last point I want to make is this whole process takes time. So you need to factor in the lead time required to do your implementation and go through transformation as an organization as well. So many of you that implemented um, accounting software, well, I implemented accounting software. It took me 24 hours to get operational. <laughs> <laughs> and ERP is different. So when you are embarking on this project and you're planning on moving, you, you need to really understand this does take time and this needs to be factored into your organization's operations um, holistically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a couple of points in there, um, but, but often small accounting systems are tethered quite tightly with your accountant and, you know, the accountant mm -hmm. has provided them, they've often implemented them, they've been running them on your behalf. How does that relationship change when you go um, ERP and are they a resource that you can draw on or is it something you leave behind? Stephen, what was your experience? Our, our accountant was the one who who wanted to put NetSuite in, so we were we were good with that. Um, yeah. On on a sort of a side note, I I do a little bit of charity work every now and again, and um, I got roped into some recently, and they said, "Can you look at our systems architecture for us?" I said, "Yeah, sure." And they had Zero and NetSuite. I said, "Why why have you got both of these systems?" They said, "Well, our accountant likes Zero, and we do our inventory in NetSuite, so." Um, <laughs> that's a uh, it's an uphill little battle that I've got to have in the next uh, next month or so, um, but it was a, you know it, that was exactly right. It was it was the, this is what the accountant likes. Um, uh, I mean, but I mean our our finance team they couldn't work without NetSuite these days. You know if we, if we sort of went backwards and had zero, they they just couldn't do that. I mean, we've got revenue recognition and all of those things. You know multi subsidiaries. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I guess there's a transition probably in behind the question here that you, you, you've you um, accountant is, is, is quite a strategic uh, role in a smaller business that you might not have a CFO, you might not have an accounting team, you're relying on them, you grow, your team grows, you kind of get probably p past the accountant, but then you've got to you switch to an ERP partner that's not necessarily an accounting partnership so it, it's it's a tricky one and one that's important to get right we haven't really talked about the, the partner and don't need to go into specifics in terms of who you engage with but um uh, uh, rich maybe that's is that some, something you can talk to uh <laughs> in terms of finding and and selecting the right partner as well as the right software yeah, it was a, it's a tricky question, right? Because I, I I wanted to I wanted to take a, take it from 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 different angles as well. Just just talking to different businesses of different sizes and and what they do. I think as businesses grow, they consider a variety of options in terms of the accounting function. Um, you know, they can continue to outsource that function to an accounting firm. They can consider recruiting a full time or part time bookkeeper or financial controller. And as they get larger, they might start to create roles like financial manager and CFO, just like you mentioned. Um, I, I think as, as you get larger and more sophisticated as a business, you will probably want more than just functional financial services, but look towards a service that can provide analysis, advice, and recommendations on your financial and operational data too. So whether you continue to outsource that or insource that is probably your choice. And I think it's a personal choice for every organization. And I've seen um, all iterations as well with organizations continuing to using an outsourced accounting function because it suits them best. Um, I've seen organizations with a blend of an accountant um, together with a financial controller uh, within the organization. I've seen organizations outsource APAR functions, but have a financial manager. There's a multitude of combinations. And I think it's up to the organization to figure out you know, where they're going to get the value from. Firstly, what do they need from their financial team? Uh, mm. um, and secondly, um, you know, what is that What is that team shape? You know, what does that team structure then look like um, over the next next couple of years? And they have to proactively plan for it. Okay. So unfortunately, yeah. I, don't have a straight, I don't have a straight answer for you, but it's something to to really put on your agenda when you are growing um, as, a, as a business. Is how does that financial function look like? 
Yeah, have, we, have this role definition of, of during the project, post project, where do you want to get to in terms of longer term yeah. objectives? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, ERP clearly next week um, is the be all and end all. You don't need anything else, um, Stephen. You you you're you're sorted. Um, and it sounds like to a large extent, it has it has ended up that way for you. But it, 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 is it everything? And um, have you needed to get other components um, uh, sorted as well? I mean, it, it is it is pretty much everything for us. Um, like I say, there really are, are no real peripheral systems that we have. I mean, we've got the Microsoft suite for you know Outlook, all of all of that sort of stuff. But it's essentially that's the only other system that we use. So yeah, I mean, we've we've managed to fit everything under one hood. Um, and like I say, I mean, the dividends that that's paid us has been has been um, remarkable. It's been it's been really good. Yeah, I guess CRM is a is a fairly common exception in in this context. But you've found CRM within NetSuite has has done performed adequately. Yeah, I mean the CRM within NetSuite's been superb. Um, I mean we had a lot of people coming from a Salesforce background. Um, they have no no problems with using uh, NetSuite CRM, um, and and often that's like a sort of a, a tough sell you know when when they've had sort of previous experience with the system i, I like it it used to do this and this um no the, the crm's working great the service is working great manufacturing um procurement all of all of that stuff um like i say we've got under one hood um you know and, and to the extent now where we use the customization net suite to put some of our compliance stuff under one hood mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a nice thing, isn't it? When you get the, those those fringe processes that you can bring them onto the same platform, have exactly the same access, visibility, security controls, and and also meet the meet the requirement. Um, yeah, it's, exactly. It's, right. a, it's, it's a real win. Um, okay, Rich, any comment on on this one? I yeah, uh, I'm really really happy for for Stephen that um, his organisation has achieved um, what I might call ERP nirvana, and that's having <laughs> uh, the majority of their operations running on a single data model on a single platform. I think, um, you know, as a vendor, we try and strive to achieve that for our customers. Um, the one thing that we do have to take into consideration is that modern cloud ERP platforms have to be very open, um, not only to um, have the potential of hosting third-party developed applications that can reside off platform, but also have very strong and very open APIs to interact with a smorgasbord of industry specific applications that we do find in customers. So I think, uh, you know, modern cloud ERPs need two approaches. On the one approach, by centralizing multiple applications onto a single data model, onto a single platform, reduces um, architectural complexity significantly. However, some businesses define themselves or define their operational model through other applications. And it is imperative for that ERP to be able to interact with those applications. And I think that's where ERPs have come a, a long way. I think in the 1980s, um, the whole notion of an ERP being the be all and end all was a very nice notion to have. It was idealistic um, back in the 1980s, but it was almost impossible to achieve. Um, and what we ended up back then was these huge monolithic, inflexible ERPs that were really difficult to customize, incredibly difficult to upgrade. Um, and with the evolution of cloud-based ERPs, we've really tried to address um, those constraints that were inherent to ERP architectures and really create an open platform that allows businesses to, to interact with highly heterogeneous architectures. So uh, an amazing story from Stephen, because uh, we, we love to hear stories like that. There's just so many benefits to, you know, um, running operations on a single data model. Yeah, integration is something to be avoided. I know from from uh, better experiences of my own. So, yeah. Um, okay, uh, audience, we are down to the last question. If you've got questions, now's the time to uh, get them into Q A Q and A. Um, but also listen up because what final passing advice would you give or parting advice would you give? Uh, Stephen, and uh, I guess we've already asked you this question, but I, I guess as a wrap up of um, what, what you've talked to today. I mean, that's, like, like I said, I mean, just touching on previous points. Um, 
I mean, it's all about where your business is going to go. Okay. Is your business complex? You know, is there multiple functions that would benefit from an ERP system? Um, and it's probably worth working out how much um, sort of efficiency it's going to bring. Um, like I say, I mean, NetSuite, putting in NetSuite made us, made us bill correctly. I mean, that in itself, um, you know, could have justified the business case. So, um, so take apart your, your business and then sort of put it back together again and look at what it would look like with an ERP. Um, and that'll give you the answer. Mm -hmm. Yep. Rich. He stole that point again. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, so it, it's funny how Stephen and I are, are, are in such agreement. So, uh, based on my experience of dealing with other businesses as well, the first thing that, that comes to mind is you've got to document where your business needs to be in the next five to 10 years, right? Because in the ERP, it's a long-term investment okay. to, to and, and to Stephen's point, you have to understand the magnitude of the problem or the opportunity then your organization is facing. Do you have a $5,000 problem, a $50,000 problem, or a half a million dollar opportunity or a five or $50 million opportunity? And you really have to understand then the impact that that ERP is going to have on your business resolving those challenges. So you might have people productivity challenges, you might be hiring people to move data, crunch data, and build reports. Your operations might be fraught with friction. So your salespeople don't know how much inventory you've got, what the production line looks like, how much raw materials are on back order or, or on their way to your factory for, for manufacturing. That kind of friction through the organization can be quantified. And I advise you, just like Stephen said, invest the time to understand the magnitude of those challenges, put dollar values to them, and then figure out what is the impact of the ERP going to be on your business. So, for example, um, if you want better reporting, what will that reporting do to your bottom line? Because I very often hear that, you know, we don't have reporting. Uh, we can't see what's going on. Well, what does that mean to your bottom line? How does it impact your net profit? Um, if your productivity is, is, is hampered, what would improved productivity do for your business? So, yep, there's going to be a productivity improvement. What are you going to do with people's time? Um, are they going to move to value-driven roles? Are they going to generate more revenue? Are you going to now then have an employee headroom available to continue to drive growth? What will that growth look like? What is the revenue? This will help you get clarity over if you should move. In terms of when you uh, in, in terms of when you should move, my answer is start sooner than later. I've seen too many organizations delaying their move from um, accounting software to ERP. And the more you delay your decision, the more you open yourself up to throwing more add-ons, more accounting add-ons at the problem, and hiring more people to be thrown at essentially what is a software problem. Mm -hmm. Factoring in that you that the migration to an ERP requires a journey that takes time, you got to factor that into your organization's evolution as well. So those are some of the key points I want to leave you all with. Yep, lots lots to think about. Um, okay, so uh, Q and A, and I've, I've got a couple um, that that have that have come in. But if there are any others, then um, get on the keyboards. Um, and this plays perfectly Jeff to um, um, Jeff raised the question uh, around the business case um, we all know it's going to cost a lot um, but how do we go about building up a budget when we don't know which one we're buying we don't we, we, we you know how, how does that how does that exercise normally completed who are you posing the question to uh, <laughs> so let's let's um so how did you do Stephen? because that's real rich is just going to make it sound yeah. so easy all right, all right. <laughs> um, i'll give you the real world i mean <laughs> you know what your budget is right you know you know how you're forecasted to grow okay if i if i'm forecasted to grow you know double my growth within the next five years then i know how much of that i can take for, for budget um with the elp i guess you've got to put hypothetical dollar values on on the efficiencies it's going to give you you know will it save you you know two head two sort of heads to stop the data reconciliation between your disparate systems there you go you've got x hundred grand there um 
So, you know, it's probably going back to that last question. It's taking your business apart and working out how much money it will save you by putting in an ERP system and, and how it's going to allow that sort of um, that, that growth. Mm. So build it, build it up from the value you're expecting to extract out of it. Uh, exactly. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the exercise. Uh, Joe, thank, thank you. So, similar sort of question. How, how can you establish ERP ROI? Maybe that's a little bit after the fact. Um, but during the process, I mean, how do you, how do you get uh, you're going through a secular selection evaluation? I guess you, you're asking for ballpark numbers from vendors and then honing that down short list. So, you, you know, getting down to tin tacks on scope um, and, and so on. But it can get complex, right? So is that, I, I, I mean, I guess it's just something that you've got to go through um, and, and be accounting for as you go through that selection process um, is what does it translate to, to if we go down that path, what's that going to cost up against the, the, the business case benefits? Rich, how's it, how's it meant to work? <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated that we're getting all these questions so an, another roll up a form for NetSuite is one of a value manager so I work with organizations as they go through their evaluation process um, and help them quantify and qualify um, their strategic and uh, quantitative benefits of where an ERP can have an impact on their organization so from a vendor perspective, we've got a lot of experience working with businesses. So we've designed and, and developed a range of benchmarks based on our experience as to what organizations could expect as an, as points of impact. So for example, people productivity improvement, uh, inventory turns, project profitability, um, technician utilization rates. So we've got a lot of experience in that. And, and I think the challenge that many organizations face is as they're going through the evaluation process, they're, they're seeing $2 values. The one is the cost of the accounting software they're leaving behind, which is invariably almost minuscule. Um, and then they're looking at the cost of the ERP, which is relatively larger. And they're looking at it from a total cost of ownership perspective, software versus software price. Um, and it's because they just, don't have any experience yet of the art of the possible. So what is what have other organizations experienced from a productivity improvement perspective? Uh, what kind of inventory turns improvements can they expect? What improvements can they expect in, in, in a cost of goods sold or, or, or a revenue improvement? So we bring to bear our experience with other businesses and help them almost complete the crossword puzzle because they're looking at a crossword puzzle with a lot of empty space. Um, and we can help them then build out that crossword puzzle based on our experience. And it really is, it's its fascinating when we do these studies and it's fascinating to see the magnitude at which the ERP can have an impact on, on the organization. And it's way beyond, for example, just replacing financials. <laughs> you know, it's very often they go, yeah, you know what, we are growing accounting software, we want to put in a, a better financial management system. Really? Okay, well, that's cool. So it's going to improve the financial team's productivity, thumbs up. What's going to happen then when we've improved their productivity? Well, they're going to move from being data crunchers and report builders to becoming consultants to the business. What happens when they become consultants to the business? Well, if the leadership now have insight on the organization's health, they can then start driving growth and taking to, um, risk um, data-driven risks for the organization. That might mean you know pulling the lever on growth. That might mean mergers and acquisitions, expansions to new countries. Now you can start seeing the ripple effect of just replacing an accounting system just with financials. When you start bringing in the rest of the operations, almost every single line of business then can receive a positive impact and it's all about modeling the journey that the organization is going to take over for example a five-year period and then offset that against the investment of the software and the implementation of the software mm. well there you go joe that's that's uh sounds like an easy path can't see any problems with that a spreadsheet could should take care of that no problem at all. <laughs> you, you, you just i built from the spreadsheet um but what, what we do find and, and this is a key thing when i'm building models we have a saying in the team uh don't pick the dirt out the pepper 
you can go into doing time and motion study, yeah, time and motion studies, and you can disappear down the rabbit hole and pop out six months later with a very, very detailed study, which will give you, you know, five stars. Um, what we find though is by using benchmarks, we can get incredibly close to the truth very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um and it's just really interesting, you know, if, if we build a model and we present it to, to a client and they look at it and go, yeah, you tweak this, tweak that, make it a little bit here. We feel more comfortable with, with these following tweaks. The overall picture that we built still remains in terms of where that impact's going to occur, generally speaking, and, and how the benefits are going to play out. So. Um, it's not an arduous process. <laughs> this, this, this short circuits that can be taken. All right, um, we've, we've probably um, over overrun our time. Thank, thank you very much, Stephen and, and Rich. That's been very engaging. I'm sure we could we could keep on um, talking uh, ad nauseum, probably to, to to the boredom of the attendees. But um, we've got a time limit on us. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, thank you to, to NetSuite for um, giving us the, the sponsorship to uh, get this event um, underway. And uh, have a great day, everyone. Good luck with your yes. converting from accounting to ERP. Thanks all. Bring it to a close. Cheers.